A few months ago at a marching band competition, I found myself puzzled by the college football stadium lights that surrounded me. Even though I was way up in some tall college football stands, the lights were still towering over me. Why were these lights so high? When I sat down to do the math, I bumped into a crazy connection. The same math we used to understand why stadium lights were so high also helped save the crew of the Enola Gay, the plane that dropped the first atomic bomb in Japan during World War II. After we analyzed stadium lights, we do some Oppenheimer-like math to help save the crew of the Enola Gay. First, let's get this out of the way. Stadium lights aren't high to keep the lights out of athletes' eyes or to see balls that are kicked high. Baseball fields often put lights low on the light posts, but facing upward so high fly balls can be seen. The answer about why the lights are so high actually comes down to the mathematics of light dissipation. To answer the question of why the lights are so high, one might start by imagining what would happen if the lights were lower. How would these lower lights shine on different players on the field and spectators in the raised bleachers? We can calculate how brightly the lights shine on these different people using some simple mathematics of light dissipation. The mathematical model used to describe the dissipation of light is called the inverse square law. As the light dissipates in all directions, it is spread out over the area of a sphere. The amount of light in one piece of the sphere hits an area four times as large if it travels twice as far or nine times as large when it travels three times that distance. That means it will be one-fourth as bright, or one-ninth as bright, at two and three times the distance respectively. There are two ways to put the relationship between brightness and distance into an equation. If we know the total amount of light being emitted, then we can use the formula for the area of the sphere and divide the total amount of light by the area it hits, with d being the distance from the light, which is the same as the radius of the sphere. The second way is to use a measurement of brightness at one location and solve for the brightness one unit away. This equation is a little simpler and will be what we use for the stadium light example. In the metric system, the total brightness is measured in lumens and the brightness at any distance is measured in lux, which is lumens divided by meters squared. And for reference, most retail stores and offices shoot for four to 500 lux so that shoppers and workers have plenty of light, but not so much that it's hard on the eyes. With these tools, we're ready to calculate the brightness of these lower lights. Let's simplify this situation by looking at a cross-section of a football field with two lights on each side. The lights are set back from the side of the field. Using Google Earth, I measured the lights at the stadium I was at, and they were about 21 meters from the edge of the playing field, and about even with the first row of the stands. We'll say that the lowered poles are 8 meters tall, which is around 25 feet, and that's typical of lights at a tennis court, instead of the typical 30 meters, around 100 feet, more typical of stadiums. We'll call the brightness at 1 meter away, K. Let's start by assuming we want 400 lux for those on the sidelines. We can then easily calculate k and the brightness in other areas. To solve for k, let's first find the distance. By the Pythagorean theorem, we have the square root of 8 squared plus 21 squared. Plugging that in for the distance and using 400 as the brightness will leave us with just k as an unknown. When we multiply 400 by k's denominator, we get k as 202,000. So how bright would it be with this light in the middle of the field? A football field is 160 feet or 67 meters wide, so we had 33.5 meters further from the light post. Putting our new distances into our formula gives us about 67 lux. Not very light and well below our minimum value. But we haven't considered the light on the other side. That would mean that it's actually double the light in the middle, giving 133, which is still not enough. The light also gives an extra 26 lux to the sideline across from it. We haven't considered the people watching the game, how bright is it for the people in the first row near the light? At ground level, under the light, the brightness is 202,000 divided by 8 squared, which is about 3,150 lux. And that's if your eyes are at the level of the pavement. If the fan is sitting on a slightly raised bleacher so their eyes are maybe 2 meters closer to the light, then the brightness is about 5,600 lux. That is very bright. It is almost full day bright. People want to wear hats and sunglasses bright. We have found with an 8 meter tall light, the fans are shading their eyes, the coaches are fine, and the players in the middle of the field have to put headlights on their helmets to see well. Okay, well maybe it's not that dark. If we want the players in the field to see better, the side lights will be uncomfortably bright, and eclipse glasses will have to be issued to the fans as they come into the stadium. If we tone down the light so it's good for the fans, then the coaches could barely see, and the players don't have enough light to see which color of jersey everyone's wearing. At this brightness, the players in the middle get five lux from each light, which is about the brightness one foot away from a candle. 
So what do we do? Having multiple lights that we could aim at slightly different areas could help, so more light is focused on the field than the stands. But this would still be a very difficult challenge with such a short light pole to get consistent lighting across the field, because the sideline is so much closer than the players near the middle of the field. Another strategy is to raise the lights. Raising the lights helps to even out the intensities. It moves the light farther away from everyone, so the change in distance from the fans, to the coaches, to the players, is not so dramatic. Let's put our light at the end of a 30 meter pole and see what happens. For coaches to have 400 lux on the sideline, K must be equal to 536,400. So we do need a much brighter light, or set of brighter light. But now the fans on the front row only have 684 lux, something that's very reasonable and could be mitigated a little by pointing more lights to the field than the stands. The coaches even get around 60 lux from the lights on the other side, so they're sitting pretty at 460 lux. And the middle of the field? About 140 lux from each light, so 277 in total. It's not quite the 400 that's preferred, but with the multiple other lights aiming towards the players, it can easily get to the 400 minimum. So that is why stadium lights are so high. They have to be to get an even distribution of light across a large field. Tennis court lights or, or street lights don't need to be so high because they don't need to spread the light over such large distances. But if you want lights to spread across multiple tennis courts or be in the middle of a freeway with six lanes on each side, then the lights will need to be much taller, which they tend to be. What does this have to do with the flight path of the Enola Gay? Well, it turns out that the inverse square law doesn't only apply to light, but about any phenomenon that emits energy or force from a point outwards, such as sound, radiation, magnetic force, even gravity, but also the intensity of an explosion. On August 6, 1945, the Enola Gay dropped the first atomic bomb on Japan. The pilots of the plane were experienced bomber pilots and they asked Oppenheimer, the lead scientist on the project, what they should do after they dropped the bomb. Oppenheimer was faced with the task of figuring out how far away the crew could be and survive, and figure out what path could get them the farthest from the blast point by the time the shockwave hits the plane. Well, Oppenheimer did the math, similar to what we did here with the inverse square law for light. A plane can barely survive a force five times the force of gravity. Planes are made to handle 2.5 times the acceleration due to gravity, or 2.5 g's. That would be a very hard landing or an intense turn in the air. Oppenheimer figured out that the plane would need to be about 14 kilometers away from the blast point of the bomb to survive, and would face a force of about 5 g's. If the plane went straight, they would be about 10 kilometers away, producing a force around 10 g's, which would easily tear the plane apart, killing all aboard. Oppenheimer told the pilots to turn hard as soon as the bomb was dropped, keep turning until they were heading away from the bomb, and go full throttle. This would get them to about 20 kilometers away when the first blast hit. This would only be about 2.5 Gs, easily survivable. If you want to see a video that goes in-depth about finding the optimal evasion path of the Enola Gay, we've linked to a video in the description, although some of the math is beyond high school level. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and share our videos. Be sure to follow Math the World on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thank you so much for your support.